It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 38, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Ben Flanner of Brooklyn Grange. Ben raises over two acres of vegetables on two rooftop farms in New York City, providing over 50,000 pounds of produce every year to restaurants, stores, farmers markets, and a 70-member CSA. We talk about the nuts and bolts of establishing a rooftop farming operation, the unique challenges of farming above the 11th story, tools, distribution strategies, and how Brooklyn Grange has incorporated events hosting and outreach into its operation. Hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Thank you for joining us at the Farmer to Farmer podcast. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmigo CSA Management Software, providing the tools you need to manage your CSA business. Farmigo CSA Management Software has a customizable management system to meet your farm's specific needs. CSAManagementSoftware.com. Good morning, Ben Flanner. Welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Good morning. How are, how's the weather in New York today? Uh, it is fairly average. It's going to rain today. I think it's still um, some of the late remnants from the hurricane that hit, hit Mexico a couple of days ago. We're finally going to get our, our half inch or so. Um, and it's supposed to be kind of windy, um, but it could be worse. Can we start off by having you tell us just a little bit about Brooklyn Grange and what that is and how you ended up there from Wisconsin? Because that doesn't seem like a, a particularly logical career path to go from, you know, we actually have topsoil out here, Ben. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a slightly roundabout uh, path. It wasn't just a straight line. But yeah, I grew up in the Midwest in Wisconsin and studied industrial engineering and moved straight out to New York, um, just uh, sort of pursuing, uh, looking, looking for adventures in, in the cities and to figure out what I could do. And I ended up working in consulting for a little bit uh, and then in online marketing of all places. So never quite using that engineering degree for, for what it is, but for, uh, for applications of what I'd learned. In about five years working in an office, I developed some some spreadsheet skills and some some business and budget types of of responsibilities. And during that period, I also became very interested in agriculture um, for a number of different reasons and things I was exposed to on one of the projects I worked on in Australia at a vineyard and whatnot, and realized that it was actually a great application of some of the things I like doing, uh, solving problems, dealing with Mother Nature. Uh, maintain a, a constantly changing to-do list, all those things that are really suitable towards small-scale diversified agriculture. So I decided I wanted to get into farming and didn't necessarily have the exact uh, pathway to um, a rooftop or to urban farming, but a number of different things kind of opened up and we saw the potential of all these huge open roof spaces in New York City where land is such a premium. Uh, however, there are numerous um, it, there's dozens and dozens of acres uh, of open space that has full sun um, that's not being uh, utilized. So, so we pursued this idea and uh, came up with a, a basic model that has worked for for some roofs. Tell us about about getting started in rooftop farming because for me, like that's just not. I don't look at roofs and go, oh, vegetables. You know, sure. so, I mean, you obviously, you made that leap and then you must have had a bunch of problems to solve once you had that idea. Sure. So what we did was the inspiration was the green roof industry because there is a growing and thriving industry, which started in Europe a couple of decades ago of greening roofs. And that does not typically encompass vegetables. It, it, it uh, involves a, a drainage system. And then just a, a few inches of a, um, a, a growing media, which is typically compost mixed with some uh, porous aggregate for drainage. And then growing hardy, drought-resistant uh, perennials uh, such as sedums and native grasses and some wildflowers and things like that. So that's the green roof industry. But what I did was saw that and, and uh, with, with my partners and, and say, look, what if we took this? To the next level and what if we got some spaces that had some scale and actually signed long-term leases on them and then rather than growing uh passive crops like uh sedums we grow active crops like uh you know productive vegetables and annuals and so forth 
And so in 2009, you started a farming operation there in New York City. Right. It was 2009. Um, I started the Eagle Street Rooftop Farm um, with a partner, and uh, we ran it for the first summer, and it was a, a success. Um, however, a lot of questions still remained because uh, we had to put together a budget for to see how we could scale it up and how we could sign a long-term lease. Um, that project was 6,000 square feet, if I didn't say that. Um, so 6,000 is, is definitely a proving grounds for the whole, whole idea, but not quite enough to make the revenues that, that I had as a target for, um, you know, to, to make it a full-time endeavor slash career. So the questions were basically, what could we gross on a square foot? And as you know, Chris, there's some data out there, but that stuff really can be nuanced based on one's environment um, because they have challenges with growing or opportunities with growing plus different pricing and marketing and everything. So I really felt like we just had to do it and then test the numbers and get some numbers for ourselves. Okay. You can look at some yield, yield charts and so forth, but everybody has a slightly different way of growing things, et cetera, too. Um, so the question was, what could we yield in a square foot? And then, of course, what were our costs? And then how could we scale that up linearly, hopefully linearly, <laughs> uh, to a, a greater scale? And then could we reach a, a deal with the landlord on reaching a long-term agreement for the space? Because obviously you don't want to be embarking on an endeavor like that, craning up a million pounds of soil onto a huge roof, um, unless you have some long-term commitment. I know I I have a lot of beginning farmers. They're like, well, gee, I don't want to put a whole bunch of effort into improving the soil if I don't have a lease. I mean, you're not even talking about improving the soil. You're talking about putting the soil where it goes. Purchasing it, yeah, and putting it in place. Yeah, exactly. And that's a challenge uh, that that is faced by by tons of small farmers, especially in the Northeast, because land is still, you know, not not even just talking about urban, but but talking about the, the price of land in the Hudson Valley and so forth. Um, it's not cheap, and and a lot of people sort of dive into projects, um, but they don't, you know, they they want that commitment to to a little bit longer longer tenure so they can start absorbing some capital uh, in, infrastructure. So you moved. So you were able to secure a lease, uh, something longer term after you kind of did this proving of the concept. Tell me about the process of of actually getting a rooftop farm in place. Um. Well, there's two different ways to install green roofs, and one is with a crane and super sacks. If you know what those are, those are those um, two cubic yard, those large sacks that are used in industrial work. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. yeah, we call those we call them sling bags, but that's so, you yeah. know what what a lot of farmers are getting their potting soil delivered in. Sling bags, so it's exactly. Um, potting mix comes in them sometimes one one or two cubic yard bags. So one way is to crane those up. Uh, with the sling on the other way is to actually use a blower truck, which is a tool that's used in the landscaping industry to move large amounts of material a long distance and you actually blow it like a, almost like a fluid. Um, we've done one, we've done roofs with, with both methods and, and, uh, you can kind of just fit, fit one or the other method based on the location and the situation. And how high are we talking when we're talking a rooftop farm? I mean, are you are you up on top of skyscrapers or are you just a couple stories off the ground? Uh, in between that, actually, we're we're talking about the the two large roofs that we've uh, that that we've occupied. One is on um, one is six stories, and the other is eleven. Uh, so, we've also installed green roofs as low as a second story building, which is which is a breeze, and then. Um, you know, there's green roofs that, that could be dozens of stories up, but I don't know of any productive rooftop farms that are any higher than, than the one that we put up above the 11th floor. Um, one Is of the main, that because of climate limitations? Uh, I think it's there. It's a combination of a couple different things. One is that typically the, the really large flat buildings don't go a whole lot higher than that. Um, and if they do, they often have some sort of plateauing and um, different terracing of, of their top level, if that makes sense. It's not yeah. just like one big flat space. Um, it's typically the, the roofs that work well for us are the ones that were built for some sort of manufacturing or, um, you know, with that type of uh, premise in mind. Um, the other thing that is a 
regular challenge, which I wanted to mention is the wind. I joke sometimes that the wind is our groundhogs, hedgehogs, deer, rabbits, <laughs> all the, all the right. mammals <laughs> that we don't have exposure to that might nip away at 10, 15 percent or something like that. Uh, the wind can cause a little bit of stress on the plant. Difficult to quantify, but, but it can be a bit of a challenge. That's not the first thing I would have gone to about being difficult, about being up on the roost. But I guess you get up, a, I mean, how 11 stories is, you know, what, about 100 feet up in the air. I guess things are pretty different up there. A little more. Um, yeah, on a calm day, it's basically the same. I think the challenge is actually on the blustery or on the, the stronger event days that you get uh, 20% stronger gusts. And then that, those can start to cause some damage, especially if they hit you at the wrong time, like right after you put in some transplant. Um, so we actually, we, we basically have accommodated it with, with doing a lot more staking. We just, we have a lot of bamboo around the farm, everything ranging from two foot stakes to six foot stakes. And um, it's still obviously a work in progress, figuring out the smartest ways to trellis everything, but just that little extra support. Of course, on the peppers, I know that that's common anyways, but um, even like a really young cucumber, if we if we put that in the ground and we get a gusty day, the wind can kind of catch that leaf like a kite and whip it around and then um, doesn't quite snap the stem, but it breaks it enough to, you know, to uh, make it so the, the veins are, they turn brown and, you know, mush up yep. and then it dies. Um, so we had to start you, you, to deal with that. We, we can add an extra piece or two of bamboo, just like a small stick just around it to give it a little extra support. So of course, that's time. Um, also, we can just start some extra starts knowing that if, if the timing is poor, then we'll have to come back through and patch in 10% or something like that. Right. And I've certainly seen that happen in the, in the wind, even down at ground level. So sure. magnify that. You know, you, you could probably imagine the typical crops that have a little challenge with that. When you're putting that soil up on the roof, what's the soil made of? Because, I mean, obviously you're not just, you're not going out and scraping off topsoil off of a farm and piping no, it up on your roof. Soil. It is a, it's a combination of, of compost for the organic matter and the nutrient and then the lightweight stone. And um, it has a very high percentage of organics because of that. However, the other growing challenge is that we don't have a subsoil. And our roots are right. going much deeper than about a foot, maybe 13 inches um, in, in some of the deeper beds. So we really do have to keep up that nutrient level as high as possible so the plants can get within that top layer of, you know, the equivalent of a topsoil depth, um, a, a lot of nutrients so the plants can be healthy. Um, one of the other challenges with that aggregate, if, if one can picture that, is that it's designed for drainage. And we've evolved it from the typical green roof media, which is really designed for drainage, to something that's, that's designed to hold water a little bit better. But we still are sort of evolving the, the growing media, especially for future projects, um, in order to come up with lens and combinations that, that adhere to the principles of what you should put on a roof, but also can really hold water as well as possible. And is, is your production certified organic? It's not certified. Um, I think we basically adhere to all of the tenants. So um, it would just be a matter of doing the work and maybe tweaking a small thing or two. Um, but uh, it could be, actually. Speaking of that, um, a friend in Chicago actually had a restaurant called Uncommon Ground. They have a claim to fame that they're the first rooftop operation to get certified organic. Okay. Hey. So you're not, I mean, it's not like you're, it's not like you're putting up a medium and then, and then loading it up with miracle grow up there. You're actually, you're doing what, what a lot of us are doing down on the ground with your soil. Right. Yeah. We're, we're doing a compost based organic system. We use a little bit of dry, um, like a, a slow release granule on relisted for, for supplements in the, you know, for fertilizer in the soil. Um, and that's a large part of what we're doing is, is, um, preaching and teaching and creating sort of a hub of people to learn about farming. And we very much are of the philosophy and the ethos of, of organic, of the organic style of farming based on decomposition and compost and encouraging microorganisms in the soil and all that. Um, you know, we have some large compost piles and we've actually been parts of, uh, of huge piles actually at ground level at, around the city with community compost projects and stuff like that. 
and we encourage people to bring up their organics, um, you know, from their kitchen and stuff when people, when people come to visit the farm and employees and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, but one other thing related to that also is that being in the city, we do have an opportunity uh, to rescue quite a bit of organics from the waste stream because, you know, there's 8 million people here consuming, throwing things away. There's way, way, way more organics than we could ever figure out how to handle. And as you probably know, it is tough hauling those around. You know, the opportunity is there to get our hands on anything and everything. But the challenge is how do you haul it around because it's wet and it's heavy and it gets sloppy and, you know, flies and stuff. But we have a couple right. of waste streams that we've identified that actually do work really well for us. Um, so they're a little bit more manageable. And one of them is chocolate husk. Um, there's a, a couple of small batch, um, although getting larger, uh, chocolate makers in Brooklyn and Queens. And they get the 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 beans, uh, you know, from different parts of the world, typically around the equator or the tropics or whatnot. And there's actually kind of a low yield in chocolate making, as I've learned. I, I've, I could be wrong, but I've heard that it's close to 50-50 in terms of what you actually get out of it to put into the chocolate that you're making, and then 50% that you have to toss. And that's typically like the outside of the bean and whatnot. Um, and that's dry. And it's in bags, so you can save it for a couple of days and it doesn't get nasty on you, et cetera. Right. So we actually are, we're probably picking up 10,000 pounds a year or so of that. Um, and we use it as a mulch as basically a top dressing. And we'll also feed some of that into our, we have a forest air compost system too, so we can feed that into it and blend it in with other things. So then you must be bringing new material up to the rooftops all the time. We are bringing up organics in sort of an ongoing basis. Obviously we, we want to have a, circular of a system as we can up on the roof. We also have some chickens, but the amount of nutrient that we get from 10 birds at each farm is, is kind of minimal. But we do have to keep up that organic matter and keep up the nutrient. And some of it is obviously breaking down at a regular basis, just due to the nitrogen cycle and whatnot. So to ha- for us to have that access to things like the chocolate husk and um, there's other things too in the in the waste system that we use as, as mulches and supplements to our compost system that sort of drives the engine and sort of keeps our organic matter up. Um, we also grow a lot of microgreens, and we typically will only use that potting mix one time, um, partly out of strategy uh, because then we can break it down quickly and then and then use that as a supplement in the field too. How much ground do you guys have? in production right well i should say i say ground how much how much roof do you have in production right now we have two and a half acres of rooftop space we have holy buckets yeah we have two spaces one is an acre it's forty three thousand square feet and the other sixty five thousand square feet um so the net planted area is a little bit less um but it's you know it's probably 80 80 90 percent of that total um and we grow in in raised beds so if you can imagine it uh, if you can imagine from a, cr- a cross sort of like a profile shot, it's raised beds that are about 12 inches high. Um, they're 40 inches wide and then 16 inch bed, or sorry, sorry 16 inch walkway, then back up to a uh, um, 40 inch wide bed and then down to a walkway and then back up to 40. So it's 40, 16, 40, yep. 16, basically just uh, uh, repeating itself across the front. And that's um, those raised beds. They don't, it's not like they've got lumber sides on them or anything. Those are just formed up, just like I would do out in the field. Right. They're just formed up. That would be way too much lumber to to uh, do that. Are those paths just down on the rooftop, or is it is it like I would have out in a farm field where I've got where I've got soil under my feet all the time? Yeah, you have soil under your feet all the time. It's a continuous green roof system. So basically, the there's a, there's two inches of drainage layer below us, below our feet. And that is separated by a fabric, and then the whole thing is covered with the growing media, with the soil. Um, and then the difference between the beds and the walkways is that you're walking on just a couple of inches of soil uh, because we don't basically want to waste it in the walkways. Right. And then in the beds, then it's mounted up to something approaching a foot. And is that all handwork that you're doing up on those roofs, or are you, I mean, do you haul a BCS up there, or how does that work? 
ECS is, I would just absolutely love to be able to use one up there, but I, as, as far as I'm, I've been able to estimate, it's just a little too clunky, a little bit too difficult to turn around and everything um, with the terrain that we have. Um, but in terms of tools, we have a couple creative things actually, and we've, we've actually been testing a little bit more, some new things. Um, one thing that really works well for us, our soil is fairly loose and fluffy because of the aggregate that's blended into it. So we don't really have a lot of issues with compaction. Um, we grow a lot of greens, a lot of salad mix, and, and we do quick, quick cycles um, in order to utilize every, every square feet, you know, being in a constrained space environment. So one thing that works really well for us um, is a, a mantis, the tiller. We have the, the largest mantis that they make, which is the 16-inch wide one. So you can basically get down the, down the rows with, with about two passes. And we're not. And that's one of these things. It's got it's got these it's got the two handlebars on it, and then it's just a it's just a a tiller, but there's no wheels on it, right? Down at the exactly that's operating down in the bed. It's a tiller cultivator, and we're just taking it a couple inches, basically, just to just to rip out and disturb enough to to kill that top layer of, well, on our green bed, you know, with arugula and mixed mustards and lettuces and so forth. Um. We also just invested in one other tool, which we're, we're pretty excited about, which is the Tilly, which also works well in our environment. It's a, uh, it's a um, battery powered, so it's much quieter. Uh, you just have to plug it in to replenish it with a lithium ion uh, battery. And it is basically, you have to see it, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a till uh, with a continuous sort of a, a wheel. System, so it's constantly spinning in this circle, uh, but it has quite a bit of torque. And it's and it, you can, it can be used as, as a variety of different things. You can actually dig out troughs, so you can use it for planting and actually moving soil. Um, with it, you can use it as like a real light sort of just like a tilling mechanism for cultivating weeds around your crop. Uh, and you can also use it almost like a little bit like an electronic wheel hoe. Um, so there's lots of different sort of angles and stuff with it, but that's another investment that we just made for, for tools. So you just said weeds. I would, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that you guys have weeds up there with a, with what's essentially a manufactured soil. <laughs> we have weeds. Um, when we get the first batch of soil and, and we started several farms besides our own as well, smaller ones. So we've had quite a bit of experience with the, the compost and whatnot. Um, typically, unless one thing screwed up, you don't have many weeds in the compost. But Chris, if you really think about it, all it takes is one, right? And That's you're right. dealing with an acre, an acre and a half. We have birds, we have shoes, we have the, a lot of different means for bringing in seeds. We have wind, obviously, and we're we're high, but we're not that high. Um, one lamb's quarter gets gets away from you in the corner, and there's seventy thousand seeds that's got to drop, you know. And then then you got to get every one of those before they bolt, you know. If you really stay on top of it, so at the end of the day, it actually becomes a losing battle um, to try to keep it with zero weeds. Like with that, like pristine situation that you start out with. Um, we so actually we have uh, one of the farms I would actually consider to be kind of high weed pressure. The other one is is low weed pressure, but they obviously both have them. So we have to adhere to all the same sort of uh, you know rules and challenges and strategies that that, that other folks do in, in higher weed pressure environment. Okay. And can I ask how much? produce are you guys taking off of that two acres of ground then? Um, we're doing about, we're doing around a half pound per square foot. So we're doing about 50,000 pounds in a, in a season between the two spaces. And would you mind throwing a dollar value on that? Yeah, I, I don't have the exact number, but it, but it's in the 200, 200 plus range with, with okay. everything all combined. So, so really up in that, that kind of that JM 40 a, uh, realm of per acre yields. I think so. Okay. Really what we focus in terms of yields, uh, what, what we really need to focus on is, um, mixed greens and, and figuring out some of the crops that have quick turnover and, and work well for us. Um, we at the end of the season we always throw all all of our crops into that into a spreadsheet and and in my kind of the main focus which is not 
uh, unheard of for, for other farmers. They, they do the same thing, but the main focus needs to be looking at all the crops and figuring out what the dollar per square foot is. Um, yeah. And, we, and, and, and then of course, in, including the unit of time that goes into it as well. Um, and even just to know that, that, that allows you to tweak your crop plan because we don't just like nix everything else that's, that's not strong. But over the years, we have weeded out a couple that really don't work for us very well. Um, Richard Wiswell talks about the, the, the time when he compared his kale with his broccoli. So I think it's just yep. a phenomenal <laughs> diagram to, to so simple to put up. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't grow broccoli either. Um, we don't put grow cauliflowers or, or, or much cabbage. We'll play around with a little bit. Um, and then the other things that, that really hurt you on in terms of averaging out your dollar per square foot is like the winter squashes and things like the pumpkins, things that take up a ton of space and you got to start them in June, Brussels sprouts, things like that. So those are, those are the kinds of things that you're really veering away from in your production system. Yeah. You know, we're only yeah. two and a half acres, so uh, it, at, the, at the beginning, it, you kind of get attached to everything, and you, you have this sort of ego that you want to grow everything and be perfect. But with a couple of years of experience, I've, I've realized that, that it's best for us to just sort of say, look, that's not our crop. <laughs> our quality might not be fantastic with it either, um, conveniently, um, and, and we also don't make money off of it, so we're just going to let somebody else grow that. <laughs> And you are a for-profit farm, right? You're a you're a business. You're not a non-profit organization. Uh, yes, we are. We're a, we're a LLC. Ben, we're going to take a break here and get a quick word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by the Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. What if you didn't have to worry about weak transplants and poor germination due to less than great potting soil? Or getting truly finished compost for your homemade blend? Or making sure that your employees remember to add the fertilizer charge? Ugh been there, done that. What if you could grow plants up until the roots filled the container without having to worry about supplying extra fertility? What if your potting soil had your back consistently? year after year. That's what Vermont Compost Potting Soil can bring to you. Vermont Compost Fall Pre-Buy Program going on now through December 21st can ensure that you enjoy the guaranteed best price, the best shipping options, and receive your soil at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992 vermontcompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farmigo CSA Management Software, providing the tools you need to manage your CSA business. Farmigo CSA Management Software is designed from the ground up to manage the CSA you operate from customer sign up right through delivery. Farmigo staff will work with you to customize the dashboard for your farm based on the way your CSA works. System setup is free and the system can be configured for a wide variety of CSA models from the traditional box plan right through fully modifiable boxes. On the customer side, Farmigo offers a portal for members to sign up, make payments, and access their account to manage vacation holds and site changes, all with the control by the farm over what can be changed and when the changes can be made. On the farmer side, you can send fully customizable confirmation emails and auto responses and generate reports to help you manage everything from harvest and loading the truck right through delivering the CSA shares. And they offer amazing customer support to you at no charge. They'll even call you if you need help. Learn more at csamanagementsoftware.com. And now back to my interview with Ben Flanner of Brooklyn Grange. So Ben, how are you marketing the produce that comes off of the Brooklyn Grange farms? About two thirds of our produce goes to wholesale, which is restaurants and groceries, but mostly restaurants. And for for that channel, we harvest twice a week, and we do the, we try to do the sales about two days ahead of time. But as as you know, it always ends up becoming the the day of and the day before sometimes. Um, but that's really going to be the, fo- the, the, the focus of our wholesale is the crops that we can really scale up um, profitably, which is going to be the greens mixes and some of our specialty peppers and herbs and different basils and things like that. Um, and it goes, the, it includes a long tail too. It basically includes everything we grow, but it's with an emphasis on, on those things. And then the other third of our farming sales is CSA and farmers markets and we do about 70 csa shares 
people come directly up to the roofs and pick up. Um, and then uh, we do two farmers markets per week. Um, as you know, the the rate that you can get that is is fair to get at farmers markets is going to be a little bit higher in terms of dollars per pound, ranging from anywhere from about ten percent increase to sometimes thirty, forty, fifty percent increase over what you what you price at wholesale. So we really do try to maximize our market as long as we're going to be there, and we have the fixed cost of the tent fee and the you know the travel to and from. Although our travel is pretty easy, it's just a couple miles or a mile, which is one of the benefits of being in the city. And then in terms of like really, so, so the markets in the CSA, uh, I guess we could just break them down. The, the farmer's market, we don't really market, so to speak. We, uh, we do some stuff on social media. We'll post a photo on Instagram of our beautiful table, and we'll mention if we have some exciting new crops coming in and stuff like that. Um, but we basically rely on word of mouth and neighborhood traffic and just developing regular customers and, um, you know, hoping that, that, that our regulars keep coming back to us. And, and they do particularly, I mean, some weeks if we run out of arugula early, I, I actually feel like people are a little bit annoyed sometimes, which is, I think, a good sign. <laughs> um, yeah. Not annoyed, disappointed. That's probably a better word for it. Um, but people really do rely on, on us for the, the salad mixes and a couple other sort of fun things we grow. And then for the CSA, we market that uh, with a newsletter blast. We've developed a decent email list through the years. Um, and then also with social media stuff. And it's basically just first come, first serve. But we also have a, a sign up and automated form on the website where people can click in and, and say that they're interested, even if it's in January before we've gotten our our organization together to, to like really start booking the shares. Then we'll save their email address and email them a month later or something like that. And then for the restaurants, um, that's probably the most grassroots the most sort of classic marketing. It's a combination. I mean, in, in 2009 and 2010, when we were just starting, um, just like any other farmer, we were taking samples. We were handing out business cards, handing out flyers, showing up, eating there to support, and then, you know, dropping off samples like crazy. Um, but we've, we've settled into a groove. And then, of course, when we expanded, we had to do the same thing because all of a sudden you're more than double your operation. you got to pick up some new accounts again. Um, but we've right. sort of settled into a group since then where we have long-standing relationships with a number of our customers. Um, and then there's sort of like a natural progression of if you do lose somebody for whatever reason, um, somebody else moved from one kitchen to another and they call you. You know, so it kind of just right. works out uh, at this point with, with wholesale where we have enough relationships that it's, that's pretty steady. How many different restaurants are you guys working with? Um, I guess similarly with, with props, there's a, there's always that long tail. Um, yep. but on a, on a, on a busy harvest day, uh, we might invoice, uh, two dozen. And, and then for delivery and, and logistics, how are you managing that in the city? Is that, I mean, are you guys loading everything down into the back of a pickup truck down on, down at ground level? Delivery can be challenging. What, what we do it actually, we, we do a couple different methods depending on which farm it's coming from, how large the load is, and what day of the week it is, because Fridays can be especially challenging um, navigating the streets through the city. So so what we do is we, we have a van that we load up for some of it, but we've actually moved a little bit more towards working with a partner. Um, there's a, a, a partner we have that has a refrigerated truck, and um, they just charge a flat fee for each location. And then what we'll do is we'll pick the day before, throw it into our cool bot, and um, they'll load it up very early the next morning, or sometimes that night they'll pick it up, and then they'll just take it straight to the restaurants. With the distribution system, it, it does seem, I think there's a value for us making the deliveries too, but uh, also there's a value for um, for folks to specialize. And you know, for, for this company that, that that's doing it, it's called uh, Fresh Connection. He's, he's got a model that, that he started where he'll pick up at the farmer's market. He'll actually merge with other farmers that are driving down. So they'll go to the farmer's market and sell all their retail stuff. But they've also made some wholesale sales, too. So he'll pick that up, distribute it. He merges that with stuff from, from our farm, um, some other different non, non-produce non products like some creams and milks and whatnot. 
And, you know, the distributors go, they got to fill up their truck, right? So I do right. like the concept of that specialization because it's hard to quantify it sometimes, but it's not always the most efficient thing for a farmer or paid staff to be driving around in the van in traffic um, when somebody else could be doing it that's maybe a little bit more professionally um, oriented towards that job. Well, professionally oriented, and I think your farm's got to be all about maximizing your utilization of your resources, which is a big issue in the for delivery and trucking. I mean, that's that's everything in the trucking business is right, right. You know, mo- moving full trucks. And you guys are all about, you must be all about, you know, getting the mat- most you can out of every square foot because there's not another square foot available. Right. You know, Hard to expand. Next door. Expansion is a big, big deal for us. So that would be a new, new space. So Ben, you you said you're doing, you know, you've got the restaurant and grocery sales, you've got the CSA, you've got the farmer's market. It also seems like there's some other things that you've got going on there with the, with the rooftop farm. Right. So we have our, our vegetable sales, um, which include microgreens as well. And then also through the years we've, we've, uh, I think as, as good entrepreneurs are supposed to, we figured out some other opportunities that, that are, are out there for us. Um, we have also events on the roof. And one of the roofs, the, the second one that we started, has a, a flat space that, that actually doesn't have soil on it, just right in the center. Um, and it was a function of, of negotiating with, with our, our landlord that they actually didn't want green roof right there. And it's, it's worked out well to have uh, just a small amount of clean space where you can walk around without getting muddy and whatnot. And the, the goal is actually to utilize that as much as possible. We've taken on two, two full-time, we have two full-time staff now, which actually don't farm. Um, they work on events and uh, all the things related to that. And that includes everything from yoga every Monday at, at eve, in the evening. Um, we have a, a small class in that space. Um, and then we have dinners, actually some weddings uh, on, on Saturdays during, during the summer and some different fundraisers and, and dinners of all sorts. Um, some ticketed events and whatnot. And then we've also launched the workshop series, which has been a lot of fun and sort of a work in progress. But basically we invite basically experts in their field and all of us do some workshops too in fields that we are experts in. Um, And then the experts come in and we sell tickets and and they they do a workshop on on whatever the topic is. And the topics have ranged everything from um, wholeness in eating and diet to, uh, how to make kimchi compost, compost, uh, composting, how to farm on balconies and fire escapes and small spaces, um, crop planting, which I teach, um, hot sauce making, you know, you name it. We've, we've ex- been natural dyeing. We've experimented with all these workshops. So that's another way to generate some, some income off of our space, which we are paying, uh, rent on obviously. Uh, and the rent right. is- very much exceeds the average per acre rent that you'd find in a, you know, in a, in a rural <laughs> community as, as right. it has to. Um, and then also we have another, so that's one revenue stream that, that we've evolved into as well. In addition to the farming, we also have a third one, which is external installations and designs and installations offsite. And it was kind of driven by the outside world um, because we, ever since the, when we started farming on roofs, we've been developing a brand at the same time and a, and a good reputation in our community and whatnot. And, and people like this idea because they, they really are, you know, especially with some environmental concerns and the other environmental benefits of green roofs, um, f- folks are excited by it. So we've been getting lots of emails and inquiries through the years. And um, finally in, in 2012, my partner Gwen just sort of said, Hey, I'm just going to go full time at this and uh, just start building green roofs and planter boxes and consulting for restaurants that want to grow some small crops in their backyard or in pots and, and all things sort of involved in greening the city. So um, we also have that as a branch of the business as well. That's really interesting. I mean, you know, kind of getting, getting paid to help set up your competition, essentially, whether it's gardeners or, or somebody who's growing growing some basil for their restaurant. Uh, yeah. But, you know, as, as you know, as a farmer, the scale of that stuff is not always yeah. really competitive. 
It's true. It's true. And then you also do some process products as well. Yes, we have two processed products that we really focus on. Um, I guess one is actually not processed, but it's jarred and that's honey. We have expanded our apiary. We, we have an apiary on the farm. Um, we have a couple beehives at each location, but we've actually expanded that to 30 plus hives throughout four boroughs. We don't have one in Staten Island yet, but we do uh, a couple thousand honey jars per year. And then similarly, um, the, the other thing that we do process is hot sauce. And we do that in pepper season. Actually, I just finished the last of our batches yesterday. And are you doing year round sales on the farm or do you guys shut down for the winter? For sales, we do greenhouse stuff through the winter. We'll keep our, we'll keep our greenhouses from freezing and, and we do weekly plantings of micros. Okay. How much, how much greenhouse space do you have out of that two acres? We have uh, about seven or 800 square feet of greenhouse. Three, okay. three uh, okay. two hoop houses and one rock salad greenhouse. Nice. Nice. That's how I carbon it. Okay. And so tell me, what are your biggest challenges with growing on the roof? I mean, you said wind, but I would imagine that there's, there's some more just overall structural issues that you run into up there. I guess if we, if we really talk about the challenges there, there's an infinite number of them. <laughs> I guess I, I don't always think about them quite as challenges just because maybe I'm used to them. Uh, and, and I think you also might be a little surprised if, if, if you were to come visit it at, at how similar it actually is to a typical um agricultural environment once you're really just up there putting in transplants or you know pulling weeds or or, or whatever um but small challenges certainly exist everywhere uh, we talked about the wind um keeping the nutrient up in the in the growing medium is is certainly a challenge and something that we've learned a lot about um also with, with soil testing and so forth learning that that our soil doesn't actually lose nutrients at the exact same rate and the exact same proportions as, as a typical soil might. So it doesn't always act exactly the same way as typical topsoils and, and thus the way we treat it doesn't, it isn't going to be the exact same way as you might uh, go by the book or, or, or something like that. Um, other challenges, obviously we have to get the stuff down and stuff up when it comes, um, which can be heavy if we're hauling things up. We do have an elevator access at each roof, so that helps a lot. Um, I've put a lot of effort in the last couple of years towards our irrigation systems. Uh, we have things in lots of zones across the farm on timers and um, you know some aerials, some drip, all things like that in order to make sure we're getting enough moisture and water to the crops. Um, the media as well also can dry out quickly. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, because it has some, some extra porosity, which relates to air pockets and airflow and evaporation. Also, it is breezy, or it can be breezy, which also leads to evaporation and transpiration through the leaves um, if they're in a breeze. And then, um, yeah, I guess those are the two reasons why, why, the, why the soil can dry out too. So, so moisture is actually a, a pretty heavy focus too, but, but I feel like we've made some pretty good strides in that category. That would be an interesting challenge. I, I would think that materials handling piece is just, has got to be huge that moving things up and down the elevators. I mean, right. whether, whether you're talking people or whether you're talking, you know, vegetables or, or fertilizer. Right. So, you know, we, we, we try to do it smart. So if we get fertilizers, we'll typically get a pallet. Um, and you can pull that up on a pallet jack. And we do have a freight elevator at one of the locations. Um, and we have a smaller storage room uh, on the second floor in that building, too. So basically, we uh, a, a truck, if you really want to picture it, a truck backs up. And we unload it with a pallet jack. And we can just take that straight into the freight elevator and all the way up can't really move the pallet around the farm once it's up. So at that point you do have to break it down and then we'll, we'll throw it in a storage room or, or whatnot, or, uh, you know, we have a shed. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of extra work with, with things like that, but logistically it's not, 
the, the most intimidating thing when we when we receive a pallet of fertilizer. And as you know, it's just a couple times a year. Although we do get more potting mix um, more than a couple times a year. Uh, and then related to the food, um, we just basically have to try to do that efficiently as well, where we'll throw all of our bins together at the same time, get them into the loading dock straight down, and then we can pull up that truck or the van right up to the where the freight is. Um, in the other farm, it's not a freight elevator, so we have to be a little bit more uh, careful with n- not making messes and so forth. Um, you know, so so that one's a, a little bit more challenging. But but we figured how to make it work. I guess that's another one of those things where talk about the challenges, and and I, I'm not even programmed to think of some things as challenges just because I'm used to them. You know. Right. <laughs> I mean, I would I would think one of the things would be like putting, you know, putting a pallet load of fertilizer into a, into an elevator, no matter how clean and looking at that weight limit. I mean, that always gives me a little bit of a sphincter factor when I'm counting people in the elevator, you know, <laughs> there's a big break. You can put a car in it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So things, things that I don't need to worry about on your behalf. Don't need to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not specifically that we, we know that we know that I've read those labels many times on each elevator and done quick mental math and uh, I don't think we've ever uh, exceeded <laughs> that capacity. <laughs> uh, one other thing that that uh, we do at the farm, um, you know, as, as you probably figure, doing a crazy project like this, putting two and a half acres on on top of roofs, um, that's amazing as a, a opportunity to farm so close to the, the city and all the demand, and you know, it accommodates certain lifestyles and whatnot. Um, but also we have this opportunity slash, I think almost obligation or, or mission, um, which is very much within our mission to, um, educate as well. And that involves the workshops that I spoke about, although those are, those are typically for adults, but we also have lots of ch- uh, children's programming in 2011, after the first year of, of our farming in 2010, we, um, set out and my, my partners took the lead on it and we started a nonprofit called city growers, which can, uh, really focus on the education for minors. Um, because we were getting dozens and dozens, uh, if not more emails and it, uh, absolutely wanted to accommodate and get as many kids up on that roof as possible, because that's what part of a whole nother topic of conversation with, um, but all, all the education that, that is, so important and it needs to be like sort of like gentle education, like exposure and, you know, just sort of like, what's it like to pull a carrot out of the ground and everything um, to, to start to, to rebridge that connection between urban societies and, and our agriculture system and our food system in order for, for folks to make smart decisions and avoid some of the empty calories and so forth that are so pervasive in diets right now. Um, so we've had over 10,000 kids on our roof since we started it. And by separating wow. the books and creating a nonprofit that only deals with children and education in the curriculum, it's been a really valuable decision for us because um, that group city growers, they can really focus on what they're doing. And then also because they're not an LLC, they can be, uh, they can have access to tax deductible donations and, um, you know, grant money and foundation money and so forth. Um, so that's one other thing that's happening at the farm, which is not actually the farm itself. We're not actually involved in it, but we share the space with kids. So if you come up at any given moment, um, there's a decent likelihood that you'll see a, a kid's group sitting around in a circle or hanging out with the chickens or, you know, doing some Burma composting and things like that. I guess really cool. I mean, when you when you look at the impact that something like a two acre farm actually has on the amount of food that's available in the city, I don't think it's going to be that great. But I think that that the value of getting people, even just seeing you know seeing agriculture, seeing something growing in the ground, and uh, I just think that's so huge. That's just such an important element. Right, and, and that's that, that's also part of our our message that that can be construed at times um, just by people getting a little too, I guess, enthusiastic. Um, but but we're, we're not out there saying that we're going to massively change the food system so that all of our foods grow in cities. Or, you know, we're, we're, that's all hyperbole. That's just not really accurate with under today's, you know, at least what how we know the world right now. Um, 
But what we're proud to be doing is we're running a business that works and, and we're growing 50,000 pounds of food per year on, you know, on these farms and, and we're, you know, creating this agricultural business, but we're also, uh, yeah, exposing the community to it. And we, we have our, our doors and our arms widely open, you know, for opportunities like this. And we want to share the space. You know, we're not up there trying to be alone or curmudgeonly or hermits, you know, on this, on this uh, green space. You can't really be a hermit in the city, can you? Yeah, well, you can, I guess. <laughs> we would sort of take the fun out of it. So, Ben, let's, let's turn here to our lightning round. What's your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool on the farm, I, I need one more year of experience with it, but I'd have to say the tilly at this point, and it used to be the stirrup hoe. Okay, great. And, and you told us about well, the tilly earlier, the stirrup hoe, any, any particular affinity for one kind or another? Um, no, it's, it's the, the classic. It's probably about four inches wide. I, I just like the, I, I love the, the sort of efficiency of it with, with weeding. Um, Another question might also be our, our most valuable tool, which is probably the four row cedar. That little pinpoint cedar that Johnny sells. Yep, we use that a lot. Actually, we have two of them at, at one site. Okay. And you do you like that better than the six row cedar? I have never used the six row cedar. Um, I actually called when we were buying our second four row cedar, well, third four row cedar, I called up Adam the tool expert at Johnny's and asked him which one he suggested because I'd heard different things about the sixth row and I know they're working on a redesign of it. And he said, considering our, our looser soil, just get the four row. So I've actually, I've had a six row in my hands, but I've never actually used it on our growing, I know in our growing environment. I really did. I like that four row cedar a lot. And I noticed you guys are, you guys have the Johnny's roller that you're also using for the bed prep and for getting that good seed to soil contact, which I think is so important with that yep. four row cedar. We use the roller yeah. as well. And especially with our looser soil, we need that extra bit of compaction. Um, before we had that, uh, before I actually even knew it existed, we had the four row cedar and we would just run a um, 55 gallon drum. <laughs> we just roll it across <laughs> the bed. <laughs> And before that, we were just kind of dragging shovels and stuff, but we knew we had to compact it somehow. But rolling that drum is, is fun for a day, and then you start wondering what's doing to your back and stuff like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your, where do you turn for information? What's your favorite resource? Oh, man, for resources, I, I guess I have a lot of them that I guess I use almost like subconsciously. Um, but really for me, it's, it's, it's mostly my, my friend base. I've, I've become friendly enough with some farmers around the region around here to some, some urban and some non-urban farmers that I just like to really pick up the phone and call them or send a text. Um, uh, I, I've read most of the, the books that are out there right now that are well recommended and, uh, also, we really keep a lot of data ourselves, too. So I love referencing our own historical data. Okay. And then I know it's I know it's still before Halloween, so I'm sorry to pull this one out, but I had a request from a listener. So uh, what do you want for your farm for Christmas? <laughs> what do we want for our farm for Christmas? I know what I want. <laughs> for Christmas, I want a automated green harvester. Oh, yeah. So are you guys using that? Are you guys using that one from Johnny's that's got the little, the ropes that whip around on it? We have the, we have the one from Johnny's. We have the one with two saw blades and it's been recommended to me that we try to seek out the, the newer version with the single saw blade. Um, okay. We haven't been using it a lot in the past year. I was recently shown a video of an amazing sort of smallish contraption sort of large-ish, <laughs> made by Sutton Ag. It's about yes. $10,000 automatic greens harvester. And I want one, but I'm not sure if I can afford one. And and I don't know, you know, the, I think they call it their Harvest Star Harvester. And I don't, I don't have any experience with that, but I'll tell you what, what we put a, I helped a client source a, a tractor pulled greens harvester. And I mean, it was, amazing what it did for the farm in terms of, I mean, it completely changed 
everything about how the greens harvest worked and was such a labor saver. It paid for itself in the first year easily. Right. Green, so. Greens harvesting is tough. And, um, you know, we have some tricks with it and whatnot. And, and I really want to wipe off the dust off of the Johnny's tool and, and figure out if I can modify it to the single blade. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I understand that Pete Johnson has a, a pretty cool one. And then also I saw an amazing sort of slightly rigged up bandsaw mechanism at Harmony Valley in Wisconsin, um, yep. out, at, out by Viroqua. Um, I, th- I think the farmer's name is Richard. And Richard that was DeWild pretty, out there. Yeah, that was pretty uh, inspirational to take a quick peek at that, too. Obviously, we're not going to have anything tractor pulled on the farm, so we need it to be lean and mean and light and something that can turn angles and stuff like that. Um, and so, so I do, I was hoping I could get a demo of that, that one in, in California from Sutton Egg, but it doesn't sound like they, they demo it out. Actually, I just emailed them. Um, but, uh, uh, but we're going to, we're going to sort of look at the books and everything in the fall and, and make a good decision between myself and, uh, and our managers on, on what we might try to test out for next year. All right. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning rooftop farmer self one thing, what would it be? I guess I would, if I could tell my beginning rooftop farmer something, (laughs) I guess it'd sort of be a combination of uh, basically hang in there. You're basically doing things right, but it's a process. And, you know, you're not going to learn everything immediately. But also uh, to really trust the advice of others, just put yourself out there and keep on meeting people and going to visit more farms. I feel like almost every farm visit I make has had uh, a lot of benefit, if that makes sense. Just going out there to see other tools and what everybody's using. Um, So it's really just to get yourself out there and keep on pushing yourself to to, uh, make that extra. Even if it's one night, you're not going to sleep. But if a friend's going somewhere, just jump in the car with them and go uh, head out there and meet some new farmers, you know? Very cool. I think that's, I think that's just great advice. It's really great (laughs) advice. So, um, and, and I, I know we need to wrap it up because, and this is fairly unusual in our farming community, but you've got to go get on a subway and uh, head off to another appointment. So, um, (laughs) thanks so much for making the time this morning, Ben. I know this was kind of squeezing it in to make it happen and I really do appreciate it. Sure thing, Chris. All right. And keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 38 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Flanner. That's F-L-A-N-N-E-R. I'm excited to announce a series of workshops that I'm doing this fall on employee management. Employees make it possible to get more done, but managing workers and their work takes dedicated time, energy, and processes. I'll be presenting full-day workshops on managing and motivating employees on the farm in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on Monday, November 30th, and in Columbia, Missouri on Tuesday, December 8th. For more information, including schedules and registration information, see purplepitchfork.com slash betterboss. If you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly mail newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things, but I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.